All right, I'm back again. It's late at night. I had to, uh, yesterday I got so angry trying to upload my long video. It took me all day. Actually, I didn't get it done till this morning. That didn't work out, so I had to do a double today. I got that out of the way. I got my intervals in, and uh, I did leg training and had a good dinner. Um, and I spent a lot of the day, I, I, I try to watch the task force. I review a lot of the stuff that's shared with me from my partners. Um, I uh, do Google quite a bit and do some searches. Um, I, I try to keep the pulse on what's going on in Alaska and all of that. And, and I'm trying to digest this stuff and, and help keep it ex understandable to you guys. And there's enough people that seem to be getting benefit of it that I'll, I'll keep it up. Um, this is, I, I'm so anxious to just talk about health and wellness and stuff that I don't need. I can just do a fireside chat. I don't need a backboard, but I'm forced into these graphs and diagrams. And so I'm over here again. It's nighttime. So I think you can see the board a little better. Um, so the topic is my observations and the hot topics on COVID-19. And I suppose everybody's seen the video. There was a pretty well done video that a number of my patients, or at least a number of my contacts, asked me what my take was on it. And basically, it was a documentary that was about an hour long that was very professionally done that implied that th this was created in that Wuhan lab. Um, I think that's kind of interesting because early on when this all started, there was a lot of hoopla about that and then I, it just sort of went away. And then this thing came out a few days ago and I watched about 20 minutes of it. And you know, I have to tell you, I'm not an expert in viral molecular biology, so I couldn't really validate their reasoning on you know, the sequencing. And, and they talked a little bit about um, um, kind of reverse amino acid, um, in other words, basically, they had a code for an amino acid that was different than the code in the natural system. It looks to me from, I listened to the task force today, they're adamant it was not a biological warfare lab created thing. They didn't address whether they think it started in that lab or not, although the mainstream news for the last couple of days seems to be implying that that looks pretty certain at this point. And that video, I, it looks like it got taken down. So who, who knows? I don't have a clue. Where did it come from? It doesn't matter. Cat's out of the bag. We're dealing with it. Um, I'll say that I've observed an increase in personal health awareness. I've got a couple of brief patient encounters that I'm going to share with you. Two different people that since this started reached out to me for various issues. Um, and because of my more available time, got quarantined like I told you, um, I spent a lot of time with them. I directed them to my health and wellness stuff. One person I think has an issue with significant autoimmune disease. Sounded like they'd been through a very elaborate workup and nada basically, but of course nobody addressed what I consider to be the horse that's out of the barn before you start looking for zebras, diet, nutrition, exercise, that kind of thing. I encourage that person to go to my wellness page and to start following my advice and um, told them I'd be happy to see him as a patient when the, the lift was um, off for a sort of non-emergent medicine, which is coming up the 21st. And I got a nice text message back that after three weeks of basically doing what I told them they should do, let's just call it the rash gone after plagued by it forever. Case number two, a young man um, experiencing difficulty with maintaining his weight despite exercise. Um, but in a, a part of the country where diet is historically pretty poor. Um, we talked about his diet at some length. Again, I referred him to, I said, just skip the chronic disease. Forget about building your intellectual property. Just read how I tell you to eat and just try eating like that for a while. 
Um, he called me yesterday to tell me that for five nights in a row he hasn't used a Tums. Uh, I'll tell you this right now, as an ER doctor for 27 years, when I see a pattern of recurrent abdominal pain and multiple workups and CAT scans and labs are always normal, it's always the diet. I mean, you know, there's a genetic predisposition, but it's how these people are eating. They're messing up their gastrointestinal system by what they're exposing it to all the time. Anyways, bottom line is, he's lost seven pounds and, it, um, and he has not required, he has no dyspepsia anymore. He doesn't need Tums anymore. He was eating 20 a night, okay? Lifestyle treats everything. All right, I'm done. I'm ready to get back to, to wellness medicine. I was planning on doing a talk on motivation for exercise and eating right and weight loss today. Gave up. I spent too much time reading, watching, too many new things to talk about. Okay, so my other observation, the natives are getting restless, all right? We all are. We want to get back to work. There's been a shift of emphasis from the virus itself to the reopening. I do get the economic impact and its effect on health. Okay, so in other words, half the country's screaming the economic impact is worse than the virus, and the other half is worried that the virus is gonna kill them or kill somebody they love, and we don't have it under control, and we're blowing it, and this and that. Um, I've seen effects of, the, economic, of, of the, the stress that this shutdown is putting on people turning into physical issues, okay? I've seen that as a frontline practitioner. I've seen what I call somatic disease, meaning stress is causing disease of the body. I am seeing that. The gastritis, the esophagitis, the chest pains, the anxieties, they're happening, okay? We're seeing a lot less viral illness, less accidents, because everybody's sitting around. ER volumes are down, by the way. Um, it's definitely a balance. I mean, there's definitely no wrong or right answer. This is a tough, tough situation that we're in. All right, some new stuff. All right, quick. I'm not going to go with big time in depth, but pa passionate use of uh, remdesivir, which is a, a, an RNA virus um, medication that's been around for a while that looked like it had some promise. A study came out, New England Journal of Medicine. That's a pretty reliable medical journal. And it does show that, that it looked like they were taking some people, small study, not a large number of patients, but uh, they were taking some people that were pretty far gone and giving them this medicine, and they had pretty good improvement. Um, but they, they do point out, they really don't have a comparison group, they, it, but at least it looks promising, and, and the double-blind studies are, are going on. So there's another one that might be in our tool bag, uh, in addition to, uh, um, hopefully, we're all hoping that the very inexpensive and relatively low side effect risk profile of hydroxychloroquine works. I think we're all hoping that. Um, all right, back to the outline. What else is new? Okay, COVID-19. This is a really big one, guys. This could be the best news ever. COVID-19 antibody zero prevalence in Santa Clara County, California. All right, this is potentially the best news going. Okay, this study just came out today, and the bottom line, I, do, I don't have the statistical background to quote the statistics and, and, and fact check them on this, but I presume it's a well done study. Here's the deal. What they did was they, they used a serology test, that's blood looking for antibodies, and they, they, they did some validation of the test and, and, and used a few different algorithms. And basically what they showed that the presence of the virus in, in the population in Santa, County, Santa Clara ranged from 2.49% to 4.16%, which makes the prevalence between 4,800 and 8,100 people infected in early April, which is 50 to 85 times greater than the number of known cases. We hope that that's what's happening everywhere. I hope New York has an 80% prevalence, okay? That damn near everybody in the state, or at least everybody in New York City got it. 
That'll be the great place to send everybody for treatment because all the nurses will be exposed. So the, the antibody test um, is going to come out and we will get some information retrospectively. All right. That is good news because it suggests that maybe there's a lot more of this virus around than we realize. Testing. All right. My thoughts. There's so much political drama about testing. I, I, I'm, I'm a little disappointed. I'm overall pretty happy with the United States and the people and how we're approaching this. Um, but there seems to be, uh, people are using this testing metric as like somehow our failure. And to tell you the truth, nobody has a clue, okay? We, we, look, I can't find out what the specificity and sensitivity of any of these tests are. I mean, I've tried Googling it, I've tried searching, I can't figure it out, nobody shares that. We don't know, I mean, it, it does no good to do a ton of tests if they don't work. I just heard that the United Kingdom bought $20 million worth of antibody tests from China that are flawed, okay? You can run those tests, you can make your testing metric numbers look good, you haven't done a damn thing for your population or figuring anything out. And the bottom line is, we can go to this graph, and I do like this site, and we can look at testing, okay? Because this graph talks about how much COVID-19 testing. You don't know that these tests in the United States are the same as these tests in Italy, are the same as these tests in South Korea, and, and we don't know which one's better. And it's gonna be a, a long time. We're gonna to have to look through the retrospectoscope to judge our country on the quality of our approach to this catastrophe that we did not create or start. Save your political fights for when the serology tests are done, we have a clear idea of how many people caught it, how, did, how good a job did we do containing it, because that's gonna answer it, and then how good did we do treating it, and then we can compare those to other countries and hopefully at least use the countries where we really trust the data and see how we did. And you know what? I guarantee you, no matter which side of the aisle you're on, you're going to have some fodder to throw. There's going to be some things that look really good, and there's going to be some things that don't look so good. Because this ain't an easy situation for anybody. Okay? Um, if you do like the metric of... Uh, the reason that I got into this, I actually got a negative comp. I don't know if it was negative. He, he, somebody suggested I was misleading people because I made a statement in a recent lecture that we were killing it, and, and primarily because I had seen reference that we were losing this battle because we had more cases than anywhere else. And I used this graph to show that one of the reasons that we had more cases is because we're killing it on how many tests we've done. And we are. We've done way more tests than any other country. I don't know how good a test they are. I don't know how good a test they are in the other country. But from a testing perspective, total volume, we're beating everybody. Does that mean we're killing it? I don't know. We're doing pretty good considering we got a late start, okay? We were the last ones out of the gate. We're a continent away from where this started, okay? We're doing pretty good, I think. Don't want to mislead anybody. Um, if you come down here to the... The, the metric that some people like to follow, how many tests have you run per thousand people? Um, the, uh, the, the United States graph looks like it's gonna pass through South, uh, uh, South Korea's graph, meaning we're, we're up over, um, we're, we're, as of yesterday, we're up over 10 per thousand, and we're about to pass South Korea, and everybody's holding them up as a great example you know, they were pretty draconian. I mean, they, they did things that I think would be, that I think are coming here, but would have been tough to push down our throats in terms of privacy, the contact tracing. Um, I think they were a little bit more strict uh, about their, um, their quarantine. And they contained it. They did a great job. I mean, you can't deny that. And, and I think their information is reliable. But point is, we're starting to pass other countries. Our slope's pretty steep. The testing's ramping up. Um, I'm going to talk to you about the, uh, the entire task force meeting that I watched today that addresses that as well. All right, back to the um, outline. Sorry. So anyways, the, the next thing is this reopening strategy, okay? Um, the Fed's plan. 
it's guidance to the governors and they don't have to follow. So it's ultimately up to the governors whether your state reopens or not and how they implement this. Um, I've, I'm going to go through the whole plan because I think it's worthwhile and if you don't like it, you can shut me off. I do like the fact that what we have is 50 experiments that we're going to learn from because this is probably not the last pandemic we're going to see. With the world's population growing, um, you know, this kind of thing, the transfer, the, the transfer of these viruses across the world so quickly, it's going to happen probably more frequently. We're going to have 50 experiments to use to see what the best plan is. Um, and, and I think that's a good thing. Now, I'm going to give you some quick comments on today's task force meeting. So, Vice President Pence says that the RNA tests in use, the, the, those are the, the testing for the virus that we're doing. Pretty much that's all that's going on right now, other than like I shared with you that one study that was a serology test are sensitive and specific, but damn, no numbers again, okay? So there's a whole bunch of tests being used, um, and apparently, at least the ones that are being implemented are fairly sensitive. Sensitive means that if you have it, it tests positive, and specific means that you don't test positive if you don't have it. I hope that simplifies things a little. He also said that possibly by the end of April, we would have 20 million antibody tests. Now that would be a great thing because that's when we can get a real idea of how badly our country is really exposed, get an idea of what kind of immunity we may have. Of course, we have no idea how long that immunity is gonna last, um, whether the virus can change. I mean, this is scary times, folks. Um, they dodged whether it came from the Wuhan lab, but they were adamant that it was not created. And um, Fauci said they're going to post the scientific paper. I, I don't know that I'll follow the molecular biology well enough to, to reassure you or not. It, it's probably a naturally occurring virus that escaped from that lab where they were doing legitimate research. Point. The bad part was they, they didn't warn everybody and they let it escape to the rest of the world. I heard this today, don't know how to validate it, that they literally had contained Wuhan. You could not travel from Wuhan to elsewhere in China, but they let people from Wuhan travel all over the world and disseminate this virus all over the world. If that's really true, that, that's really concerning. Um, they have almost performed... Okay, one thing that they said, and, and we're going to jump down to, uh, to the actual... Um, uh, phase three document, but one thing they said was the capacity for testing is in place right now to meet the requirements for the phase one reopen. So states have the ability to test at the level necessary to open. Um, they also said we're, we're almost to four million tests, so they, they you know rounded up four million tests in one month for nucleic acids that we didn't even know existed a few months ago. I think some of you people that are yelling about how we're failing on testing don't understand how complicated it is to test for um, nucleic acids. This is not a simple test. This is not, you know, you've got all these different labs trying to develop tests. They've got to be validated. You've got to make sure they work. You have to send them out. You've, I mean, this is a giant endeavor. I am impressed that we've made it to almost 4 million tests for something we didn't know existed a couple of months ago. Um, if you're not impressed, that's fine. I think it's pretty amazing. And it sounds like things are really improving. But we still don't know what we're doing. We're not going to know for a long time. Look back through the retrospectoscope, and you can make your arguments then. Leave it until then. Pray for our country. All right. So, um... Swabs. I guess there was initially an issue with the swabs, but the experts have broadened the swabs, so it's really not that much of an issue. And they've also simplified the media that the virus has to be transported in to test it. So looks like the components necessary for testing are improving. Um, the uh, I think you guys are all aware the um, the the Abbott test, which is the beds the point of care test um, uh, is uh, um, a 15 minute test 
there's machines, 17,000 of them, I think, scattered around the country, but they can only make 50,000 cartridges a day. And they got to send them to the right places with the highest need. Um, I think they said, they quoted that we're right now about 120,000 tests a day um, from four different subgroups. That sounds pretty good to me. We're doing all right, I think, considering everything. Um, positive test contract contact tracing is coming your way, okay? So if you happen to have been around somebody who um, had a positive test, you, you may get a knock on the door and want to be tested. That's probably important and makes sense, good strategy. Um, they are planning asymptomatic surveillance of 300 to 500,000 people weekly particularly the vulnerable, certain close contact, workplace environments. Obviously, they're gonna probably be keeping a close eye on us medical workers. All right, so I want to go through the, um, the document, which I read last night. So this is the proposed state or regional gating criteria. So this has to be satisfied before you can go into the phased comeback, or this is their recommendations. Governors can do what they want. This is their recommendations. Okay, symptoms. A downward trajectory of influenza-like illness reported within a 14-day period. N, a downward trajectory of COVID-like syndromic cases reported within a 14-day period. Cases. Downward trajectory of documented cases within a 14-day period or a downward trajectory of positive tests as a percentage of total tests within a 14-day period, flat or increasing volume of tests, make, saying you gotta be doing at least the same amount and we see less. So, okay, so either way. In other words, if your tests are increasing in volume because you have more volume, but the percentage of positives is decreasing, they're good with that. Hospitals treat all patients without crisis care, meaning they're, they're able to take care of everybody right now, as it is, and there's robust testing program in place for at-risk healthcare workers, including emerging antibody testing. So we wanna know if our healthcare workers are, are, are immune. All right, I got a couple of concerns here, okay? I drew my little draft. Here's my concern, okay? So, let's just say, pick any place. This was when it first showed up. It's been climbing, it's been climbing, it's been climbing, it's cresting. We'll say this is day zero. These are the number of cases. Okay, so 14 days goes by and you're seeing the metrics met. So they start to relax whatever their plan is. The governor comes up with a plan, no more social distancing or less social distancing, more businesses open. Now. The problem is, it's gonna take about 14 days before cases start to show up. This stinking virus is rotten because it doesn't make you sick fast enough either. Highly transmittable, causes bad stuff. If you don't get a huge viral load, it may take a while to get that furnace cooking and start causing all those problems we talked about in Coronavirus 101. So you don't start seeing people present for testing until maybe a couple of weeks afterwards. So I'm a little leery of everybody go all these places that basically did a good job and have almost no disease, like Alaska, for example, lessening their, their, um, their degree of being careful, possibly allowing people to come in from other areas that were like this into our area. And then we find out that, you know, the, when you relax these restraints, these places where we know the virus exists in a high amount, we start to see it come up and realize that we should have done it. But now the cat's out of the bag in those places. Because by the 14 days, you, you, it's spreading. That's my worry. I hope that makes sense. I think I explained it like my concern. I worry about the delay that it takes for people to get sick enough to start presenting for testing. Now, there's gonna be testing in asymptomatic people and that's part of how you probably help prevent that. But it's complex, guys. 
Okay, now they have, here's what you need in place, core state preparedness responsibilities, okay? And, and again, according to the, to the um, task force, Every state should be able to do this right now once their governors feel that their health capacity, healthcare capacity is met, the testing is not the ability to issue. They said they've, we, they've got the test. So testing and contact tracing. Quickly set up safe and efficient screening and testing sites for symptomatic individuals and trace contacts. Okay. Ability to test syndromic influenza-like illness indicated persons for COVID and trace contacts of COVID positive results. Ensure sentinel surveillance sites are screening for asymptomatic cases and contacts for COVID positive results are traced. Those are going to be the, um, the old people, the nursing homes, lower income places, uh, racial minorities and Native Americans in particular. So they want to be surveying in some of those places. In the healthcare system capacity, ability to quickly and independently supply sufficient personal protective equipment and critical medical equipment to handle dramatic surge in need, ability to surge ICU capacity. And then plans, protect the health, safety of workers in critical industries, protect the health and safety of those living and working in high risk facilities like senior care, protect employees, and users of mass transit, advise citizens regarding protocols for social distancing and face coverings and monitor conditions, and immediately take steps to limit and mitigate any rebounds or outbreaks by restarting a phase or returning to an earlier phase depending on severity. And then they come down and they say, Individuals continue to adhere to state and local guidance and complementary CDC recommendations, obviously hand washing, avoid touching your face, sneeze or cough into a tissue, disinfect, and face coverings, we should be using them. Um, if you feel sick, don't go to work or school. Contact and follow the advice of your medical provider. I'm not sure we're not going to a world where until this is over and the world's either immune, immunized, or, I mean, we've all had it and we're immune or we're immunized. I'm not sure we're not going to a place where when you have a runny nose, you get a COVID-19 test. I mean, you know, in other words, if you have a viral illness, you, it's your duty as an American to go present yourself for your COVID-19 test, hopefully with very rapid turnaround time. And if it's negative, you go back to work and say, thank God it was just the flu. And if it's positive, you know, well, you probably shouldn't go to work with the flu, but you know what I'm saying. I'm not sure we're not headed to that place. Um, Employers uh, develop and implement appropriate policies in accordance with federal and local regulations and guidance informed by industry best practices regarding social distancing, protective equipments, temperature checks, sanitation, disinfection, business travel, monitor workforce for symptoms, don't allow symptomatic people to return to work. Um, develop and implement policies and procedures for workforce contact tracing follow-up employee COVID positive test. So phase one. Individuals, all vulnerable individuals should shelter in place. Members of households with vulnerable residents should be aware that by returning to work or other environments um, where distancing isn't practical, they're putting that person at risk. All individuals, when in public, parks, outdoor recreation areas, shopping areas, should maximize physical distance from others. Some social settings of more than 10 people should not be done. Avoid socializing in groups of more than 10. Um, minimize non-essential travel. Employers, encourage telework, return to work in phases. Try to avoid congregating in common areas. Non uh, minimize non-essential travel. Consider special accommodations. Um, and obviously worry about the vulnerable. And then specific types of employers. Schools still stay closed. Senior living, still no visitation. Um, wait, should be prohibited. Visits to senior living facilities and hospitals still prohibited. Large venues still out. Elective surgeries can resume. This is important. You know, I've seen a couple of cases where I've been practicing recently where, you know, are they elective or are they urgent? And, 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 the urgent ones 
are going to make it into the, they can have surgery. Example, biliary colic. You don't have an infected gallbladder, but you come in with belly pain, you got gallstones. If we kick that can down the road long enough, you'll come in infected and have an emergency surgery. That's kind of an urgency. I'd like to get those gallbladders out. Um, carpal tunnel syndrome, right? Simple, brief surgery, totally elective. But if you haven't slept for three weeks, and I just try to treat that with pain medicine, and you don't get your surgery for another six weeks, you're gonna have a narcotic habituation problem by the time you finally get the surgery done. So there's a lot of surgeries that you could argue how elective are they, and, and, I, and, and I'm glad to see that we're gonna lessen those sort of things. And it says gyms can open if they adhere to strict physical distancing and sanitation protocols, and bars are still closed. When we get to phase two, Vulnerable individuals should continue to shelter in place. Members of households with vulnerable residents should still be aware. Um, precautions should be taken. All individuals when in public should maximize physical distance. Social settings of more than 50 people where appropriate distancing may not be practical should be avoided. Non-essential travel can resume. Hey, by the way, I was supposed to land in Lahui seven hours ago. And uh, this morning, I couldn't see the trees across 20 feet away here, here in Alaska. So, um, you know, this affects all of us. I was supposed to spend 10 days surfing in Hawaii, and there that went. But I have lots of time to do videos now. Um, encourage telework still. Still close the common areas. Strongly consider the... Um, special accommodations, especially vulnerable people. Schools and organized youth activities can reopen. Visit to senior care facilities and hospitals should be prohibited. Strict protocol for hygiene that anybody, anybody that's going to squeak through that. Large venues still out, so no sporting events. Elective surgeries resume. Uh, gyms can remain open. Again, and bars may operate with diminished standing room applicable. Phase three, vulnerable individuals can resume public interactions, um, but practice physical distancing. Low risk populations should consider minimizing time spent in crowded environments. Re employees can resume unrestricted staffing of work sites. Senior care visits to um, the people that go in and visit them just have to be super diligent. That's never going to go away. Um, large venues uh, are, are back under limited physical distancing protocols. So movie theaters, sporting events, are probably going to keep us spread out. Gyms have to stay sanitary. And uh, the bars can open with some increased standing room capacity. Um, and then just to define the vulnerable individuals, elderly, and those individuals with seriously serious underlying health conditions, including high blood pressure, chronic lung disease, diabetes, obesity, asthma, and compromised immune systems. All right. Sorry, I didn't know if anybody, it's available online, obviously. It's, it's a reasonable, sensible set of guidelines. If the governors use it, I think it will be helpful. I do have my caveat there that I do worry a little bit about um, bringing disease from places where the incidence is high into places where it's low during that little window of time after the downslope and we're relaxing things before we actually have a chance to see that the relaxation plan didn't work. We all want to open back up. Me as bad as anybody. I, I want to fly my beaver all summer and not just see COVID-19 patients that are dying in respiratory distress. I'm not sure which way it's going to go, um, which takes me to the last part. Um, I watched uh, Governor Dunleavy on a news channel today. Um, he was talking about beginning the reopening process of Alaska. Those of you that aren't in Alaska can buzz out. Um, I'm going to give him kudos. He was aggressive early, probably why we don't have a pandemic currently. That's my opinion. Um, you know, he got a little head start. You know, they, they, they brought that guy in from China. Um, we, we got some people from China that ship, that, that shipment of 
Chinese Americans, um, you know, people, I'm sorry, Americans who were in China and they came through Alaska. So he kind of got a heap of help into this early. Must have scared him enough because he quarantined in while I was, you know, out of town. And, uh, um, you know, it, it cost me a little bit of work. And, of course, you know, I, 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 the place I was at still doesn't have a case in their entire county. And I'm not yelling at him. I think what he did was good. It was, uh, it was pretty broad-based. You know, you out of state, you quarantined for 14 days. Um, it looks to me like, you know, we're doing pretty good. We've only got still, I think, less than 300 cases. We are steady at a 3.4% positivity rate on testing using the guidelines that I've shared with you before. So I'm giving him kudos there. He made brief mention of reopening medical care routine on April 21st. That means I can go back to seeing patients in my clinic for routine stuff. I'm glad for that. We're gonna be very cautious. I'll wear an N95 mask because I don't wanna catch it and give it to somebody when I'm working in the, in the front lines that is a compromised person. I'll have my patients that come see me wear a, a personal cloth mask and we will stay apart from one another and there's really very little interaction where I'm going to have to get more than six feet away other than a brief physical exam. Uh, certain components of my evaluation I'm going to cut out because of, like, like the exercise stress testing because they would breathe so hard I don't want to aerosolize. So I, I get to go back into that. That's great, you know. Um, the relaxing on elective surgery restriction, that goes into effect on that day again and then there's another loosening farther down. That mandate came out. I think that's great because there's there's some need out there and right now things look stable enough here that it looks like we don't have to worry about having a hospital bed occupied by a routine post-op patient because we're going to need it for a ventilated COVID patient. We're doing pretty good. Working on the fishing industries. You know, we've got three industries in this state. Oil is number one. Tourism and fishing are neck and neck. They're both seriously compromised. But oil's compromised by global things. There's nothing we can do to help oil right now. It's just going to have to change. Well, use a little more fuel to fly people up here. But, I mean, it's going to take global changes before oil comes back. The other two, we got to make a decision. And he didn't mention anything about um, tourism. He said, working on the fishing industries, I worry because that is one industry in this state that has a lot of political lobbying clout, and I'm afraid that sometimes economics make us pay less attention to obvious science. I've, I think I've witnessed that in my 27 years here, and I just worry, I, I'm not so worried about commercial fishermen coming up, quarantining on their boats or wherever they stay, and going out and catching the fish because they're not gonna be rubbing elbows with one another. I worry about the cannery settings, particularly in the small towns where we might inadvertently transport people from all over the United States, some of which have high incidence of disease and may be asymptomatic, may not be properly screened by a sensitive enough test may not quarantine adequately, or their quarantine's gonna be in a barracks in some small town in a cannery that has no medical infrastructure, and one asymptomatic person, by the time they become symptomatic, half of that cannery could be exposed, and you could have a giant cluster in a very bad place. And then if that happens in multiple spots across the state, and oh, by the way, you know, we let tourists back in and we get a, a little updraft from that. And pretty soon, you know, I have no idea what our capacity is. We've got quite a military uh, presence here. Maybe we can throw up some 3,000 bed hospitals real fast. And it sounds like there's plenty of ventilators, so they'd send them to us. But we could have a real issue, and I, I still worry about it. Um, he said we're looking at getting restaurants back open. He said the caseload's not that high. I agree. He says it looks to be flattening out. It seems to be about 3.4% of the people that meet criteria for testing have the disease. 
I haven't seen the downtrend yet. He said, we do have hospital capacity. I'll take him at his word for that. I don't have any way to check that. And it's time for us to start easing off because we can. My thoughts on that, I'm still concerned that we don't know what we're doing with testing. And I, uh, you know, I, I, I just hope we're testing a lot of people here. I saw on the, on the task force presentation, I think we were in the, the darkest color for testing, I think 90 per thousand is where we're at here in Alaska. So we're testing a lot of people. The disease isn't here right now. My problem is I'm afraid we're gonna bring it in and then we're gonna have a huge spike and we're not gonna be able to handle that spike after we just about cut our own throats avoiding it these last two months. Um, tourism, if you quarantine the tourists, then they don't come in. So that's kind of, you know, you either got to decide the quarantine's going to be lifted and then you have a tourism season and you, I don't know how you screen those people unless we, in, in the very short period of time, have a way to test everybody, you know, that comes up here. Do we test people that come from areas that have a lot of disease? I, I don't know. That might make sense. I mean, I really wouldn't be too worried about my friends from Sydney, Montana coming up. They, they don't have a case yet. You know, it's Eastern Montana, they're spread out. I'd be a little concerned if I had a bunch of people coming from New York City, you know. Um, so I think that's, that's a consideration. And then again, the canneries, how are they gonna quarantine? I, they may have a strategy, I've heard different ones. If they come up with a good one, there may be one that's relatively safe. I hope to God I am 100% wrong, I'm worried we're gonna see a lot of disease here this summer. Maybe summer will burn it out. I, I mean, I, I, we can only pray. Anyways, that's kind of my take on the whole thing. This is not a political issue. This is the greatest, I, I'm, I'm 56 years old, I've never seen anything that even compares as a threat to this country, and, and every country in the world for that matter, as this thing. Um, it's real. It's virulent, it's transmittable, it can overwhelm any medical system if you ignore it. We don't know how long it's gonna be around. We don't know if immunity is gonna be preserved for very long. We don't have any kind of idea what percentage of the population is, has been exposed, yet we will. Um, it's a little early to, I mean, I, I think, doing some test cases of reopening, especially in places where we know there was a high prevalence and we're clearly on the decline and they've been very strict, like New York City, um, in their quarantining and kind of seeing what happens before we sort of like take places where there's hardly any disease and, and say, all right, just blow off the quarantine and, and then see those spikes because I think it takes, there's such a delay in the spike I'd rather be a little more observational for a while. We'll see what the governors decide to do. I'm ready to be flying a beaver. I wished I was in Hawaii. I'm still waiting to figure out whether the strip's gonna be open the first week in May, because I'm still scheduled to spend a week in Las Vegas seeing patients there, and they haven't called and canceled my, uh, my, my hotel reservation yet, because as of right now, the strip is closed through the 30th, and I get there on May 1st. Might they extend that or are they going to relax? Who knows? Everybody's up against the same thing, man. So much uncertainty. Um, all right, I probably went on longer than I should. Hope you enjoyed it. We'll talk tomorrow. I promise I'm going to not watch anything on COVID. I'm going to talk about motivation for exercise and eating right.